<laughs> well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. It's nice to see you all. Uh, last night, I was so inspired by by Connie's wonderful stories, and uh, when she was telling us about the the family Bible that was burned and how that history was lost, it reminded me of this poem. Uh, you all know the painting, the American God with the guy with the pitchfork. <clears throat> so this poem is called American Gothic. It's easy to make fun of this famous long-faced pitchforked couple, but in old photographs, my great-great-grandmother looks just like the careworn woman, both of them paired to the bone by toil, both rigid with occasion, holding themselves upright by sheer will. As if revealing feelings would be unseemly, the painted woman and the real avoid the artist's gaze, camera's lens, stare into the middle distance, turned inward, lips ironed in grim straight lines. What sad meat Grant Wood's woman eats, we can only guess, but I know my ancestors' griefs penned as they are in our family Bible in her copper plate hand, ink now the rusty color of old blood. Four babies dead before they turn three, two within days, one gone on Christmas Eve, into the arms of God, she said. There are times on earth so brief, she listed them right down to the hour. No wonder she had forgotten how to smile. Well, okay, that's a sad one. This is a happy one. Uh, this is a summer poem. It also has to do with family life. Every year when I go to Chicago to visit my daughter, we go uh, from Chicago to the Oak, Farm, Oak Park Farmer's Market. <coughs> Oak Park Farmer's Market. Saturdays, the church parking lot blossoms into a tense city of plenty. We vow we'll just pick up some lettuces and ramps for salad, new potatoes, one bunch of French breakfast radishes to slice and eat on buttered pumpernickel. But greed flicks its tongue, and suddenly our bags bulge with acacia honey, veined cheeses, sour cherries with wild black raspberries, baby patty pan squash. And of course, we're compelled to eat the famous donuts, still hot from the vat that church cooks pass up through basement windows into our waiting hands. Skins dusted with cinnamon sugar, crisp to the bite, yield to fluff, so good we could eat a dozen just standing there. Fat glistening on our chins. Thank you very much. marveling at how close they were. They were both written in 2009, one in April, the first in our read was in April. Um, then my daughter had a very, very scary and severe illness, and after we got sort of the first step done, the things where she was being looked after, or she was, other people, professionals were watching her, I wrote the second thing, and the third thing is, now I'm here. <laughs> Um, the first piece, I'm climbing on out to tell me I'm supposed to use my hands here, which is pushy. Um, white space. White space. Well, my name? Oh, yeah. Elizabeth Steiner Milligan. White space. White space is the stories between the lines and words, behind paintings and photographs. White space is for the initial launching of everything big and good. 
It is strategic and powerful. It is invisible. And therein lies its full strength. White space is everything that we are very sure that we understand completely. Its borders are what we can understand. To live completely in white space, one must not care about leaving a recorded legacy. And one must conscientiously avoid being recorded. Some will always operate completely in white space. More will merely trail fingers in it. Most will never leave the outlines. White space is not crowded. Okay, that was big. The man I found out my daughter was very, very ill. And early June I wrote, anorexia nervosa coming up for air. And this was just to let my friends who were online with me know that I was still alive. I said to my friends on the inhale, terribly cryptic, I know, but the best I can manage right now. Draped in red flags, she teetered on a precipice. Friends and family embraced her. They see the deadly outcroppings on the way down the chasm below. They see that the light ends. Like phantoms, new precipices loom forever anew. There is no road map. Thump, 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 thump. Chest tightens, shoulders hunch, nerves tingle, hands freeze, head throbs, back tightens, full throttle ahead. Three years ago, just before I turned uh, 80, I was taking a class at poetry at the University of Scranton. And in all my years of going to school, I never crammed for any exam in my life. But that morning, I had not written the poem that was necessary. <laughs> so my body woke me up at 4 o'clock in the morning to write this poem. And I wrote this poem in about, about a half an hour. And uh, so uh, I, it's uh, just that uh, I this is pretty good. Excuse me. Stay close to the mic, Dr. Moore. Sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The title of the poem is The Best of the Bunch. The sun, this had to be uh, uh, Elizabethan sonnet, but the, was the standard for the day. The Best of the Bunch. The sun shares its energy with us all. Animals, vegetables, short or tall. A photon here, photon there. It doesn't really seem to care. But it beams probably when one becomes special. And then, how does itself here on earth, showing off its golden worth? Great, full of itself and sweet, as all the qualities that meet the challenge to come up to muster. With the complexion of such luster, handpicked to become divine, destined not for juice, but for wine. <laughs> <laughs>